Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this new week of studies. As we continue going through this series of articles and assessing much of what has been said, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may have wisdom and that we may be able to consider the words that are presented here along with the words of Scripture. Shall we now ask for this guidance and this blessing in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you today and we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath that are past and for this new week. We thank you, Father, for your willingness and your ability to forgive our sins. We thank you that we are able to reason through articles such as this, to compare these with Scripture, and to address that which needs to be done so that we might more clearly understand the role in which we are to play and we are to fill at the end of this earth's history. May our minds be opened by your spirit. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction, as well as the protection of your angels. Help us so that our minds are open and we may rightly consider these things. We ask that your will is done. We thank you for the blessings that you are providing. We thank you for this time of study. In all things, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now, when we met on Thursday, I gave some homework. Now, did anybody choose to do the homework that was handed out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I read those passages. Okay. Now, here again, in the last two paragraphs before the conclusion, it is being stated that the five kings that are fallen are Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and Papal Rome. The sixth king, the one in place at the present, we know is to be the United States of America, which is inclusive of the image of the beast, apostate Protestantism. The kingdom of Daniel 1131 is dealing with the time period of the transition from Pagan Rome to Papal Rome, from the fourth to the fifth kingdom. This transition is confirmed in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 10. Now, in this situation, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 10. I'm going to read beginning at verse 1, and we will go down through verse 10. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all the power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they revealed not the love of the truth that they may be saved. Now, the premise here is that this trans transition is going from the fourth kingdom to the fifth kingdom. Is this something in these seven kingdoms that we would have agreement with? Well, obviously, we believe that, um, you know, you have the daily being taken away and uh, the abomination desolation set up. So there is this idea in which Rome is divided into separate periods, pagan, papal, then the, and then the United States, and then the UN. But, you know, so he's obviously trying to deal with these as being the, the heads. So this is pretty typical um, of, of how we looked at things in the past. 
regarding uh, applying the heads to the beast of Revelation 17 and thus then to the riddle of Revelation 17, which we now understand that we can't do that. But, uh, so, so there is a transition, right? I mean, obviously, between pagan and papal Rome. But where he's trying to apply it uh, from Revelation 17 is incorrect. And I think that would be an agreement with a lot of all that, that has been studied in this movement, especially over the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. Now, he continued, as an eyewitness of pagan Rome as the fourth kingdom, Paul informs the church that this power, pagan Rome, will yet be removed to make way of the mystery of iniquity. This mystery of iniquity is no less than papal Rome. So if we were to read Great Controversy 356, first paragraph, here Mrs. White states that the Apostle Paul warned the church not to look for the coming of Christ in his day. That day shall not come, he says, except there come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3. Not till after the great apostasy and the long period of the reign of the man of sin can we look for the advent of our Lord. The man of sin, which is also styled the mystery of iniquity, the son of perdition, and that wicked represents the papacy, which as foretold in prophecy, was to maintain its supremacy for 1,260 years. This period ended in 1798. The coming of Christ could not take place before that time. Paul covers with his caution the whole of the Christian dispensation down to the year 1798. It is this side of that time that the message of Christ's second coming is to be proclaimed. So we're not disagreeing with what Mrs. White has said, but with all of the, the other points, we're going to have to see if we can agree that his use of her passages is correct. Well, I mean, the use of the passages are correct in the sense that the passages are talking about the transition between pagan and papal Rome. That's one of the things that we saw in the Great Controversy is that really she's iterating or reiterating the view of the pioneers in regard to the daily, the two desolating powers and how that transition occurs without talking about the daily as a word directly. Right. So, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, there's just things he doesn't see. He's not applying truly the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate as two entities that are joined by a single word, the word and. Yeah, so so he's looking at them as, as two separate kingdoms. Correct. Rather than as part of the same kingdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. At this point, <clears throat> they cannot be two separated kingdoms because they are joined together in the book of Daniel. Yeah. So, I mean, we used to take the position that there's only four kingdoms, right? So, you know, we would talk about there being four kingdoms. But, you know, we, we, we see this division of Rome, right? Rome has these stages that, that are more detailed once you get to Revelation 13, right? Okay. It's going to give us, you know, well, it's going to give us first that we have uh, Papal Rome, which has this beast with seven heads and ten horns. So we can see that Papal Rome has these different characteristics, similar to what Papal Rome had. But we're going to see, well, the ten horns are going to be uh, the ten divisions of Europe, right? Uh, the seven heads now are going to be these kingdoms that Rome is is copying. Plus, it also contains the future aspect of, you know, because we say that one of the heads is the United States and another one of the heads is the UN, right? So that's all contained within papal Rome. So... To say that they're all successive kingdoms in the way that he's trying to say doesn't really make sense. Well, he's just missing out on things, right? So it's not like completely wrong, but it's not completely right. Agreed. It, you know what I mean, like there's just details that he's missing and, and a lack of clarity. 
Now, in Great Controversy 446, first paragraph, the special characteristics of the beast and therefore of his image is the breaking of God's commandments, says Daniel of the little horn, the papacy, he shall think to change times and laws. And the law, Daniel 7.25, revised version. And Paul styled the same power as the man of sin who was to exalt himself above God. One prophecy is a complement of the other. Only by changing God's law could the papacy exalt itself above God. Whosoever should understandingly keep the law as thus changed would be giving supreme honor to that power to which the change was made. Such an act of obedience to papal laws would be a mark of allegiance to the Pope in the place of God. So the pagan portion sought to be worshipped instead of God, and the papal portion is choosing to be worshipped above God. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why Daniel 11, verse 36, it, it's describing characteristics that are connected to the papacy, to the right. mystery. Right. I mean, it's pretty clear that that's what Paul is referring to, that he's referring to that section in Daniel 11, verse 36 and on, uh, when he's talking about the the man of sin, the son of perdition. Right. It. And Ellen White makes the same reference. She makes the same connection between Second Thessalonians and, and that portion in Daniel chapter 11. So, I mean, it's just such an obvious connection, which is where Uriah Smith goes, goes wrong in trying to say, well, that's France. Right. So, I mean, he could make this clearer. He could, he re could really clarify that Second Thessalonians is connected to verse 36 he's just going to mostly deal with verse 31 right the transition part at, at least at this part here right so he's so we know that the context of daniel 1131 is this transition and we can see that then the papacy is just being described in verse 36 i mean it's the most straightforward way to understand that whole section so he has this this view of of how he's trying to i guess what is he trying to do? Is he trying to sort of, because uh, he's he's taking a view similar to ours, yet he's he's also trying to address Smith, right? So is he saying that there's almost like two different ways to look at the same passage? Is that sort of his main point? I think what he's trying to do is he is trying to find the manner to blend in Smith's viewpoint and give credence to Smith as if his view was completely acceptable. Yeah, even though he's 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 going to take a, quite a different view about uh, verse forty, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, it, well, he's trying to blend oil and water. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, if you stir them together at a really high speed with a blender, I mean, they will mix, uh, but they will eventually separate. Well, that's that's quite a comment because in his career, he was one of the best water well drillers in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, okay. So he would have great experience in knowing just how difficult it is to get oil and water to combine. Yeah. So, you know, the the point that I've that I've had to address with him and with some others is that while I recognize that there is a a statement attributed to Mrs. White that Uriah Smith's book is God's helping hand, I cannot agree that this is a blanket endorsement stating that Smith is completely correct in every view that he has. Right. And of course, we, we dealt with that in detail when we were dealing with uh, uh, David H. Thiel, right? Right. 
And so we looked at other endorsements that she gives, such as the Daystar article by Crozier and the Midnight Cry by Snow, though she doesn't actually name Snow by name. But people take that as an endorsement that every detail in what he presented in the True Midnight Cry paper of August 22nd must be correct. Right. Because Ellen White endorses, you know, the Midnight Cry. And of course, there's many details there that are incorrect that would contradict her plain statements. So we need to understand what an endorsement means in that sense. And I find your I. Smith's Daniel and Revelation very, very useful in giving you a basic understanding of those prophecies, those books. But there are places that he gets things wrong. Well, you know, she's not labeling him a prophet, that he's God's appointed messenger or anything like that. And even Miller, who is God's messenger, did Miller get everything right? No. We know he didn't. Right. So and, you know, he had, you know, the angel Gabriel there helping him and giving him the commencement of the prophetic periods. But it doesn't mean that he understood every detail about those prophetic periods. And even when God guides us, you know, as individuals, you know, because this is a problem that we find, you know, there will be people who, you know, write on my YouTube videos or our YouTube videos, you know, that God showed them something, so it must be true. And, you know, so we're all wrong. Everything that we're doing is wrong. And so it is possible God does show some people certain things. But people can then take what God has shown them and distort it over time, right? Right. Maybe God's showing them something for a specific reason because God's working in our lives and he's trying to teach us something. But we can't then say, well, now since God showed me this, everything I think about it is correct. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. As individuals, we don't become an authority. Even if God has shown us something, we still, you know, God's word is still the authority. And we still are constantly learning. So, you know, I would I would never take the position. Well, because God showed us all of these things. Now, everything that we're doing is correct. And the way we understand everything now is perfectly correct. Well, one is because we constantly keep learning and correcting ourselves. And I expect that that will continue to some point that, you know, we're always willing to be corrected, that our understanding is always incomplete. If Ellen White says, you know, a certain point, like the decree goes into effect in the fall of 457 B.C., that that's something very specific, right? Talking about Cersei's decree. And, and, you know, I find it interesting just because I'm having a discussion about 457 B.C., but if you talk to many Adventists, they will see the, say that the decree goes forth in the fall of 457 BC. Is that correct? That the going forth of the commandment is in the fall of 457 BC. Is that correct? I think so. No, because the going forth of the commandments in the spring. And Ella White never says the going forth of the commandment is in the fall. Right. So so even sometimes when we we read something in the spirit of prophecy. We read into it presuppositions. Right. And, and the same with the Bible. So we always, even our understanding of something that's that's true. So I may have, you know, become an Adventist and I, I read, you know, the decree goes into the effect of in, in the fall of 457. I think that that means that the, the going for the, the commandment was in the fall. And I teach that. You know, I probably taught that. Uh, I know I did. Because that's what our books say. Right. Because they're not very precise. They don't they don't even know Ezra's journey was never talked about. Right. Can you ever think of of an Adventist book that you've read prior to being in this movement uh, that would talk about Ezra's journey and the dates and, you know, the river Hahaba and, and so forth. Any study that that the church would have regarding Artaxerxes decree. 
and I can quite tell you, I've read all those books. Nobody mentions it, right? I've never so, heard it. Yeah, but the pioneers talk, talk about it, but even then they don't fully understand it, right? Because they don't connect it to their history. They don't connect 457 BC to the dates other than the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So they have this impreciseness about the 2300 days. They, they try to figure out when it ends, but they never nail down exactly when it begins. Because remember, Miller's going to have the going forth of the commandment in the spring. And, and they never argue that the going forth of the commandment is in the fall. Well, I shouldn't say that because Snow has some confusion about that, where he tries, he, he gets it wrong, actually, about how uh, the dates work with the, um, 457. So, you know, there's just there's just constant learning that goes on. And uh, so so the fact that Smith gets some things wrong shouldn't shouldn't uh, in any way diminish what Ellen White says about the book and as far as being God's helping hand. But it, it shouldn't give us the impression that the book is then infallible. And, and that's why this is such a strange argument that, that people try to make. So, I mean, I guess with, with your friend here, he's, you know, because I asked this before about his audience, but there must be some way in which his audience is people who've been in this movement. And the fact that in, uh, you know, a lot of his friends would be pushing for Uriah Smith's book to be correct in this point, right? Well, I mean. I can't speak that a lot of his friends would be pushing on that with Uriah Smith's book. Well, people he knows, whether how close they are or whatever, okay. but he must know of that, that, that idea within, even though he's now in Alaska, but you know, he's from, from Washington, right? He, he's originally from Arkansas. Oh, no? okay. Uh, he lived in Washington but he's also lived in Idaho. He's lived in Texas. He's um, he's been all over. Yeah, you, you Americans do that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, now, but anyway, am, he he would know the people, some of the people, I would think, right or not. He okay. He does know. <laughs> he does know many that have been in the movement. He'd had okay. some battles with Tanya Beeman. Okay. Okay. Because Tanya is one that is emphatic of her support of Uriah Smith and his viewpoints. Okay. Okay, but, that would make sense. Yeah. Okay, the others that he has known, I cannot speak for one, for I have very little discourse with this one friend. Does he know Rich? Yes, he does know Rich. However, most of the rest of the friends that have that he's been associated with in the movement do not hold Uriah Smith in as high of a regard as Tanya Beeman does. Okay. okay. But anyway, there there is some way in which he's obviously aware of this and, and he's addressing that. It's just um I mean, it could be in his own mind that he's trying to reconcile these things. Correct. Right. So, um, Brother Theodore and Dwight. Yeah. I found that quote that I was talking about on Thursday. Please. It's in, it's in Review and Herald, February 14th, 1899. Okay. And it, I'm going to read the paragraph. Okay. It says, All High and high or low, if they are unconverted or on one common platform, men may try to turn from one doctrine to another. This is being done and will be done. Papalism will may change from Catholicism to Protestantism. Yet they may not uh, may know nothing of the meaning of the words. A new heart also will I give 
you. Accept new, ex, accepting new theories and uniting with a church do not bring new life to anyone, even through the church with which he unites may be established on the true foundation. Corrections with connection with a church does not take take the place of conversion. To subtract the name to <laughs> to sub the name. I'm gonna skip there. The name to the church. Creed is not of the least value to anyone if the heart is not truly converted. Sorry about the Yeah. So yeah, so you misread it. But yeah, I was gonna yeah, say because it says papists may change from Catholicism to Protestantism, not papalism. Right? Where's it? So she's talking about somebody who's a who's who's a papist and he can become a Protestant. Right. So he says there's just a work to be done in true conversion. Just because somebody becomes a Protestant, he may not know the meanings of the words. Yeah. So, yeah. So you just misunderstood the statement. I just thought I'd let you know that I uh, let you know where I found it. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for doing that. But that's what I figured must have been the case in what she said. But because one is we looked up papalism and Catholicism. Uh, and Protestantism. I looked up all those. Yeah, okay. I stand corrected. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah nobody's upset. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes we misread things. I do it all the time. You know, I read something, and you know, and then I go back and look at it. And I said, well, I didn't quite read that correctly. I just, you know, misunderstood, which happens. So, okay, thanks. Hey, Dwight. So yeah, that's it's kind of an interesting point. Mm -hmm. So now, for what we're what we're addressing and how we're addressing the rest of this, as as we would continue from Acts of the Apostles two sixty five, but before the coming of Christ, important developments in the religious world foretold in prophecy were to take place. The apostle declared. Be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, this is a passage we just read from Second Thessalonians. Paul's words were not to be misinterpreted. It was not to be taught that he, by special revelation, had warned the Thessalonians of the immediate coming of Christ. Such a position would cause confusion of faith, for disappointment often leads to unbelief. Have we seen this occur within our recent past? Have we seen disappointment leading to unbelief? Mm -hmm. Yes, it still has. Okay. The apostle therefore cautioned the brethren to receive no such message as coming from him, and he proceeded to emphasize the fact that the papal power, so clearly described by the prophet Daniel, was yet to rise and wage war against God's people. Until this power should have performed its deadly and blasphemous work, it would be in vain for the church to look for the coming of their Lord. Remember ye not, Paul inquired, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Terrible were the trials that were to beset, to beset the true church. We're seeing this occurring daily. Even at a time when the apostle was writing, the mystery of iniquity had already begun to work. The developments that were to take place in the future were to be after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. 
Especially solemn is the apostle's statement regarding those who should refuse to receive the love of the truth. For this cause, he declared of all who should deliberately reject the messages of truth, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. And they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Men cannot with impunity reject the warnings that God in mercy sends them. For those who persist in turning from these warnings, God withdraws his spirit, leaving them to the deceptions that they love. Thus, Paul outlined the baleful work of that power of evil, which was to continue through the long centuries of darkness and persecution before the second coming of Christ. The Thessalonian believers had hoped for immediate deliverance. Now they were admonished to take up bravely and in the fear of God the work before them. The apostle charged them not to neglect their duties or resign themselves to idle waiting. After their glowing anticipations of immediate deliverance in the round of daily life and the opposition that they must meet would appear doubly forbidding. He therefore exhorted them to steadfastness in faith. Are we any different today than the Thessalonians were? We what? I didn't quite catch that question. Are we any different today than the Thessalonians were? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, not really. Now, the whole point here with these passages that were presented, they are not supporting pagan to papal Rome going from the fourth kingdom to the fifth kingdom. So the statement that is here, that he is the, the premise that he's trying to make does not prove valid. Now, that is my opinion. Mm -hmm. He writes in his conclusion, one of the primary functions of the book of Daniel is to show the succession of the kingdoms that in a special way are the persecutors of God's people. Up until verse 31, the main kingdoms of paganism have been outlined in their order. Gabriel starts with Media Persia since the fall of Babylon has already occurred. Greece is next, then pagan Rome. These four kingdoms form the sum of the persecuting powers of paganism. So here again, he is attempting to expand the situation, stating that pagan Rome is kingdom number five. Excuse me, that papal Rome yes. is kingdom number five and that pagan Rome is number four. I have a difficulty with that because that's not the way it's presented on the charts. Right. There's only four kingdoms. Now, you know, so maybe part of the problem is that, you know, when we're talking about the seven heads, right, and we're saying, well, these are seven successive kingdoms. Well, they're definitely not, there definitely is only four kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, right? And and pagan and papal Rome are still part of the same kingdom, as is the U.S. and the U.N., as we say. So, I mean, we could say, you know, they're different. Uh, I mean, there's there's a relationship to it, but there isn't. You know, we understand it. We understand the details of that. So, I mean, I don't have some. In some ways, I don't have a problem with saying, well, this is the fourth, the fifth, the sixth head of the Beast of Revelation 13, right? So we have these heads, and in some ways, you know, when you go to the Pioneer View on on chapter 12, 13, and 17. Right. They're going to say that the heads are forms of government. Now, they can consistently do that with each of the beasts. But in some ways, don't these kingdoms represent different forms of government? You understand what I'm saying? Not not no. exactly in the same way, but, you know, it's a characteristic of Babylon. Right. Babylon has a particular characteristic. So we could say it's Babylonian rule, how they operate how Medo-Persia operates, how Greece operates, how pagan Rome operated, how papal Rome operated, how the United States operates, and how the UN operates. They, 
there is a certain type of form of government for each of these, if we want to put it that way. Now, of course, pagan Rome has all these other different forms of government, but we're just talking about the overall characteristics. So we could say they're characteristics rather than, you know, form, forms of rather than kingdoms. But it, it's not trying to give us the seven heads aren't trying to give us the kingdoms of the book of Daniel. You understand what I'm saying there? Right. And and so, so one of the arguments, and I've had this discussion with other people, so like people who've taken the pioneer view, for instance, on the heads of, of Revelation chapter 13, that it's going to be the pioneer's view that they're going to be. So there's, well, I've had dis- different discussions. So the discussion regarding, well, they need to continue to be forms of government every time that, that, uh, you know, that's inconsistent because we already have the body, the leopard, the bear, and, and that represented in uh, the beast, right? So they're saying, well, you know, this has to be the forms of government. It can't be, uh, you know, the kingdoms, right? And then there's people that are going to argue, well, all of them have to be the kingdoms. And, and you run into problems such as, well, if you're going to take the position that uh, the seven heads in Revelation 17, one of the heads is the papacy. Well, the woman is the papacy, right? The one riding the beast. She She's the papacy. And so we take the position that the seven heads are the hills of Rome upon which the woman sitteth. It, 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 it's a better description. It's more consistent. But yeah, there's there's all this impreciseness, I guess, that, that people have. And, you know, the thing, I guess, that we have done, that he says, you know, the minutia doesn't matter. Well, it matters, right? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm having a discussion with a guy in one of our uh, YouTube videos where, you know, he's saying, uh, well, I just want to know when Artaxerxes began his reign. You say it's December of... of 465, so that makes the seventh year of Artaxerxes uh, to be 458 BC, right? And I don't want to know about all these details about, you know, how we count their reigns and everything, right? You know, you're just wrong. But but those details do matter, right? Yes, they do. Right? You need to know that you just can't count the, the succession year as the first year, that they never do it that way. Right. The Persians don't do it that way. The Jews don't do it that way. And and only northern Israel does it that way whenever it's a new uh, uh, dynasty. Right. So they're not going to do it if it's, you know, the son dies, not going to count, count it that way. Um, you know, or the dad dies and the son takes over. Um, right. So all these details matter. And yet, for some reason, people don't want to deal with the details. And yet, you know, those are the things that are going to help us, like, sort through these problems. And he's doing a lot of writing, not really telling us too much, right? He's not being as straightforward as he could. He could have used all that time uh, to figure out these details and, and to present them. Right. Now, verse 31 details the transition from pagan to the papal form of persecution. In one sense, this is simply following the same line of succeeding kingdoms as outlined in Daniel's chapters 2, 7, 8, and 9. As we have already noted, this transition is extremely significant as paganism hands its characteristics to papalism. The persecuting power now moves away from the secular realm and enters into the spiritual. It is the mingling of the unholy seed with the holy seed. This mingling produces two distinct lines of fathers, its pagan lineage and its Christian lineage. This is the point where the woman or the church becomes involved as a persecuting power. And this is where, in type, Samson's lion changes forms and becomes sweet in the form of honey. Okay. First off. Okay. Yeah, go on. In following the the same line of succeeding kingdoms where do we find that succeeding 
the line of succeeding kingdoms in Daniel 9. Well, we definitely don't in Daniel 9, so I'm not sure maybe he he just made a typo or something. No, I mean, this is specific because he's joining Daniel 9 with the other two. So I find that interesting. Okay. The point of 2, 7, and 8. Maybe he's just like, maybe he's just taking 8 and 9 together as, as a unit, but I'm not sure why. All right. 2, 7, and 8 outline four kingdoms. Babylon to Rome. Yeah. So... Yeah, so there's some other problems here. So so he says that uh, paganism hands its characteristics to papalism. Now, paganism, pagan Rome gives its power seat and great authority, right? But I don't think paganism hands its characteristics to papalism, right? No. The characteristics, uh, those are something that is assumed or subsumed by the papacy, right? Right. That is, the papacy is, like, it's it's incorporating these things, right? It's absorbing them, right? That's what subsumed means. I just looked it up to make sure I'm using the word correctly. So that's where it gets its characteristics. But it is a, I mean, that's what it's talking about. If you read carefully through 31 to 36 and on, right, that that section up to the 39. I mean, it is showing you that history. Now, in, in Revelation 13, you know, we're going to see that because the power seat and great authority is given from the dragon to the papacy, that we see that there is a continuity that occurs Right. That so there's a continuity that occurs because of something paganism does, pagan Rome does, and then there's also a continuity that exists because of how papalism responds to what occurs. Right. So and there's almost like two different aspects of 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 this transition, and one is that we're going to see that paganism has to be taken out of the way. Right. So we have that. Uh, uh, the sir, right, of take away in Daniel 11, 31 and 12, 11. And then we have the room of, of Daniel chapter 8, where it's going to uh, lift up and exalt, right? So there's these two, two things that happen. Paganism, you know, is going to give its power seat and great authority, and papalism is going to absorb these characteristics of pagan Rome. But also paganism has to be taken out of the way in order for the man of sin uh, to be exalted. And so if he was going to to address this issue of the daily, and, and part of the problem is he's trying to connect the daily to what happens in, in our interpretation of Daniel 11 verse uh, 40 to 45, I guess, right? That whole section, right? I guess from 31. But yet he's not doing it correctly, right? You understand what I'm saying? I do. Like he's not making the argument that he's not making the connection. He talks about these two things, never shows us how they're connected, why the correct view of the daily leads to the correct understanding of these passages. But he could, right? You know, he has that ability to do that. He has that information, at least he should have, from the 2520 and so on. But he just, he's not making that argument. I get that. Yeah. It, again, I, I find it frustrating sometimes just dealing with, I guess that's the only thing that really frustrates me, is when somebody's thinking isn't clear and they don't explain themselves well. That's why I have a hard time reading uh, some people's writings, because... I'm always correcting what they're doing and it just gets in, in the way, like, like structurally, you know, how they're putting together paragraphs and sentences and so forth, because we need to communicate clearly. But part of communicating clearly is understanding something clearly in the first place. And I don't think, I think he has more like an impression of something, but he hasn't really sorted it out. 
so this this whole thing of dealing with the kingdoms and how he's doing it isn't really helping his argument. Anyway, go on. Okay. He continues, this one argument alone, the daily as paganism, is sufficient to show that the fifth kingdom, that of the papacy, is the king of verse 36. It is interesting to note that the old view of the daily comes to us as a result of Miller's rules. And as we progress, we will make a more direct application of these rules in order to establish beyond question the identity of the king of verse 36. This will give us the bearing we need in order to arrive at the correct position of the kings of the south and of the north. Okay, so if we had the new view of the daily, right, which which I used to have, I still had no problem seeing the transition of, you know, between what was happening in verse 36, that that's going to be the papacy, right? Now, obviously, understanding the true view of the daily clarifies some of those verses, right? Agreed. But, but we, we still put it in the same period of time. So there's nothing about the new view of the daily that would make you think, that verse 36 is referring to France, right? Correct. So this argument just seems to fall flat. It, it does not, as we would say, it does not hold water. Yeah, and and actually people who take his position regarding uh, the daily, the true view of the daily, might see it as an argument for Uriah Smith's position, right? Now, of course, he's going to try to talk about, well, we got this uh this transition of kingdoms i don't know it, it it's rather confusing but anyway we have to go on we have to move forward to try to figure out especially in in the next article but um where he's going to try to put that together for us okay now he segued from his conclusion to try to present something regarding the next article in our next article, we will be taking a look at Uriah Smith's position, who contends that the king of verse 36 is France. His book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, has the endorsement of Ellen White. And because of that endorsement, many in Adventism hold to his interpretation. As we look, the intent is not to simply respond to his position and move on, but to show how he got there and perhaps more importantly, to reconcile the inconsistency of that view with the clear endorsement of his book by Ellen White. Here, the he is assuming a blanket endorsement. Mm -hmm. My position, my opinion has always been that this <clears throat> book should allow us to properly reason from cause to effect and not to take this as an endorsement that says that everything that Smith is addressing is correct. Mm -hmm. It can be demonstrated that as the Jews were not given the present truth for the Millerite time period, neither were the Millerites slash pioneers given the present truth for our time period. This principle is found in Luke 4, 16 to 30, and shows that for each generation, Christ opens the book and then closes the book. Okay, so this, this, is, this is a misleading, dangerous kind of statement that he's making. This, this idea, well, you can see the seed of this with um, Parminder, right? Correct. Uh, right. So... So is this idea at all true? Like, is there any truth in this statement? And if there is, where does that truth begin and end? There's enough truth here to be very, very dangerous because it's being misapplied. Right. Okay, so what is the truth specifically that he's using, and how is he misapplying it? He's misapplying the situation of the messages that were given to the different periods okay so that we we understand that in different periods we understand some things some things are not present truth correct in one generation or another so that 
So that's true. That is, there are going to be things that, that God reveals to us now because they're important now, but they weren't, and, 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 and you know, it's not that they weren't important, but they weren't the main message. And, and those details, one is they couldn't be seen, right? Because as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, things that, that were hidden to us become revealed, right? Just natural. Like the message of the Millerites wouldn't have been present truth, you know, in 1000 AD. It, it becomes present truth at that time. But how is he applying it? How is he misapplying this then? What what is he trying to do? At least what I think he's trying to do in in this argument with Uriah Smith. I'm asking you to to figure out what I'm thinking. <laughs> Why this is dangerous? Yeah, yeah that, sometimes that sometimes that is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but here. So what is he what is he going to do with this? Why is he bringing this in here in this connection with what's going to be coming up in the next part? Maybe we could read the next section and and then we'll see how he's misusing this principle that he has. Now, and and then he's going to get this principle from uh Luke chapter 4 verse 16 to 30. And, and that's going to be um, where he's going to take the statement from where Jesus quotes uh, Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And, and then he's going to finish to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But he doesn't quote the rest of that verse and the day of vengeance of our God. Right. Right. And this, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So I'm not sure how he's getting this. I'm, I'm not sure what, why he's using this passage to say this principle is found there. I mean, maybe he's just saying, well, there's a certain where it's partly fulfilled in the time of Christ, but it also has an application to the second coming. Is that would be what he's trying to say? And I'm not sure why he goes all the way to verse 30, because we have why, well, you know, he could have gone to verse 20. Right. And he says he closed the book, right? So he had opened up the book, the prophet Isaiah, and then he closes the book in verse 20. So maybe that's a typo. Maybe he meant just to go to verse 20. Uh, I mean, verse 21, he says, this, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears, right? And then he's going to go on and talk about physician, heal thyself, and so forth. So maybe he wanted to go all the way to verse 30. But I don't think he's applying the, this correctly. I don't think he understands what the principle is. At least he's not, he's not really giving it very clearly. But, but I guess we can go on and try to see how he applies it, if he even refers to it again. Okay. Now, do, have I pulled part nine up before you? Yeah, yeah it's there. So his next section that he wishes us to, to examine there's been much discussion through the years regarding Ellen White's endorsement of Uriah Smith's book, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation. Especially is this true now in the time in which we live, as we see things happening with Turkey, Russia, and Islam in general. This endorsement has been used by many people to either establish or to confirm their belief on the Eastern question as regards to the identity of the king of Daniel 1136 and the kings of the north and the south from Daniel 1140. I, too, have taken her, her endorsement seriously, as she plainly commends this book as one of great benefit to the reader, linking it to some of her own books, such as The Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, and even calling it God's Helping Hand. So that connection is just the fact that Cole Porters are selling it. Yeah. Right. Not that it's like inspired in the same way those books are. Yeah. She she gives this commendation to say that the Cole Porters should sell it, should market this book. But she never says Uriah Smith is a prophet. And what he says is to be held in the same level as scripture. Right. In consideration of this, the question is, how much does this endorsement encompass? We just addressed that just a, just a few seconds ago. Mm -hmm. 
is it a blanket endorsement? In other words, by inference, would it be fair to say, Mrs. White states, that the king of the Daniel 1136 is France, and the king of the south is Egypt, and that the king of the north is Turkey. And using the same line of reasoning, would she then go on to state that the seven heads of Revelation 17.9 are the four, seven forms of the Roman government? Now, he asks many questions here. We just addressed how we have seen this regarding how this endorsement is encompassed. Is this a blanket endorsement? I believe we've agreed that it's not. Yeah. But, but you know, it's something that he, he contemplated himself, right? So Correct. So he took this, this endorsement. Now, how do I take all of these interpretations of these different verses that seem to differ from what? other people are saying, am I going to just stick to Uriah Smith, what he says as being the truth? Is she endorsing it in that way? That's kind of what he's asking. Now, I have contemplated this for many years as I have studied Daniel 11. Through these years of study, I have been brought to a dilemma concerning this very issue, as I respectfully but strongly disagree with the conclusions that Uriah Smith has arrived at in his study of Daniel 11. I have also realized that I am not alone in my disagreement. The question then becomes how to reconcile this major disagreement with the endorsement of Ellen White. Is this possible? At this point, I think we've just shown that it's very possible and that she is not giving a blanket endorsement. And she's not saying that, that Smith is totally right in what he presents. Question now, is he willing to accept that? In this article, one may need to read between the lines, so to speak, in order to fully grasp what I am trying to say. There are two separate threads combined into one, Uriah Smith's interpretation and Ellen White's endorsement, the first up front and the second operating in the background. The main point cannot be simply to refute Uriah Smith or to somehow sidestep Ellen White, but to see how these things line up in the context of our study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. If these are two separate threads, they so remain as separate. I don't see them being combined into one. And the attempt to do that, I think, harms the understanding that the reader can obtain. Yeah, so basically, he's saying you just can't simply refute Uriah Smith, right? Correct. Which I think you can. <laughs> the endorsement doesn't in any way imply that we 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 can just we can't just simply refute what he's saying using the Bible. Now he's going to go into this view, which which I don't agree with him regarding Wikipedia, but okay. In my study of the prophecy of Daniel eleven, I made good use of thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation as an aid to understanding the history that took place in the setting of the prophecy. It is my belief that history is being rewritten and that much has been lost, changed, or simply dumbed down through such services as, as Wikipedia and others. You know, this is something I, I hear from a lot of people. I don't believe it's true that history is being rewritten. Uh, that's really, really... Now, there is, you know, revisionism, historical revisionism. So that is, we could say it's being reinterpreted, but the facts are still there for everyone to look at. The internet actually provides a greater access than we ever had before uh, to this information. So somebody needs to obviously be careful. You know, you don't, you don't just look at one source, but the thing about Wikipedia is it gives you the sources, right? And you, and you can, you can find the sources on the internet and read them, correct? Correct. You know, so um, so Wikipedia sometimes gets mistakes in it, you know, occasionally. But because you have so many people who are experts in that area and, and experts not in like official experts, but amateur experts uh, that care about all these details that, uh, yeah, sometimes Wikipedia will get something wrong where there's a disagreement. But actually, uh, <laughs> We got a lot of detail on the internet. 
uh, a lot of precision, a lot more precision than we would have had, uh, you know, 40 years ago if we had access, you know, to a public library even. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get a lot of these original documents. We wouldn't be able to go back to the source and examine things for ourselves. We'd have to be like the university library or something. And even then, we might not have access to some of the material because it might only exist in one place in the world. You know, you know what I'm saying? Right. So now we have all kinds of information and we can access it very quickly. Right. Because I've done research before we had the, the Internet and it would take a long time, sometimes hours and hours to find a single quote, which now I can find in a in a matter of seconds. Right. So and I'm not really sure why he he brings this in. Like, how does this even relate to to understanding that that prophecy? Is it is it just an issue of information? I, I don't think so. You understand what I'm getting at? Like, it, it's just kind of an irrelevant, irrelevant statement. It's entirely irrelevant. Now, he continues. In using this book, I have discovered two key defining statements made by Uriah Smith that have served as markers for me that determines where he went off track. In other words, it would be the same principle as applies to John Harvey Kellogg, A.T. Jones, and E.J. Wagner. Inspiration tells us that the Lord worked powerfully through each of these men, but somewhere in their individual experience, they each went into error. The fact that they went off, however, does not negate the work and the message of these men before they slipped into error. The same is true of Uriah Smith, though his error was not of the same magnitude as was theirs, nor did he lose his hold on Adventism. He okay. simply was not given the present truth for our time and therefore came to some conclusions in Daniel eleven thirty six 36 to 45 and Revelation 17 that are not consistent with the present truth for this generation. Okay, so here he's trying to apply that principle that he talked about. Right. Right. Now, so he wasn't given the present truth for our time. Right. Now, we know, of course, what ends up happening in Adventism is a rejection of the 2520, which Uriah Smith appears to be the leader in that rejection. And, and part of that comes from the polemic of dealing with those who are using the 2520 for time setting initially, right? The age to come people and so forth. Now, so did Uriah Smith have the ability to understand these verses correctly? Yes, he did. Because James White understood them correctly. Correct. Okay. So it can't just be that there isn't present truth for our time, that that's the problem. Because James White understood it. Okay. And even with the issue of Revelation 17, the reason why he goes in that direction, I mean, partly is because he's actually sticking to the pioneer writings. But we got people like... Uh, uh, Joseph Bates, who appears to understand those verses more correctly than Uriah Smith. Very much. He, but he's going to he's going to reject those arguments. OK, so, yeah. So I don't think that that's the problem. I don't just think it's just that, you know, he's not in our time because he should have been able to lay down those things correctly. Now, he's also going to. You know, because we, we've gone through this before, but we're, we're picking out different things that we never addressed before, like this, this point here. But, you know, he's going to talk about the two, the two points where he goes off, right? And he's going to have, which the one, obviously, we're, we're familiar with, it makes sense, where he tries to say a king, right, instead of the king. And then the other one is where it says, and there are seven kings, and he's going to say, well, these are seven kings, right? So those are the, we've looked at that before, but we would actually agree with, in a sense, that not that we would translate these are seven kings, but or, or like we wouldn't translate it that way. But it it would actually be more consistent with the interpretation that that he has that these are seven kings, right? Right. So so the fact that he he makes this as a mistake of Uriah Smith's as one of his key mistakes. 
of these two key mistakes doesn't really make sense because he's in a sense agreeing that the seven heads are seven mountains, which are seven kings, right? Okay. Your friend would agree with that. But we're taking the position that Uriah Smith is wrong in, in saying that the seven kings are the same as the seven mountains or the seven heads. Correct. So I, I'm at a loss. Right. We, we went through this before, but that was that was the real problem for me. Is that things just don't follow like the, the arguments don't follow. And he still has never really showed us how the new view of the daily would lead to an incorrect understanding of these these verses or how the true view of the daily would give us the correct because Uriah Smith believed the true view of the daily, right? And yet he gets it wrong, verse 36. Right. Uh, so let's see. He's getting it wrong because he is not willing to consider that the seven times of Leviticus 26 is a prophetic warning. And he's, right. not, he's not willing to accept that the seven times as presented the calzone vision is combining the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate in their powers to set aside a true understanding. Yeah. So he's trying to do something. He's he's trying to reconcile this Ellen White statement with what Uriah Smith writes by saying, well, just Uriah Smith didn't have the ability to understand these because of the time in he, which he was living. Right. And yet, you know, the whole issue that's here um, is is the fact that Uriah Smith does reject the 2520. So and we all know that that's in the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. Correct. He right. has a note that rejects the 2520 and those Many of these people who accept Ellen White's endorsement of thoughts on Daniel and Revelation believe in the 2520, correct? Correct. So that's where he should be trying to see the reconciliation. If he's going to. I mean, we understand the problem, right? That that he's facing, but he has the key. If he if he's going to try to convince these people who believe the 2520 and also believe that Turkey is uh, the king of the north, then they they can't they can't reconcile that. He he should he should bring up this really clear problem and show the problem with Uriah Smith is that he doesn't understand the 2520 because that's basically how we approached it. Correct. But, you know, we weren't really even trying to reconcile Ellen White's statements because I didn't feel that it needed to be reconciled, per se. But I can definitely show that Uriah Smith is is not taking into account the 2520 when he deals with verse 31 to 45. It's not so much. Now, in a sense, we could say, well, it's about the true view of the daily, but he holds the true view of the daily. So obviously it's not just about the true view of the daily. It's about these periods of time and how they're connected. Exactly. So, okay. So, so I don't think we need to read every, everything here because he's going to go through a bunch of stuff that I don't think we need to read. Um, right. Cause we've gone through it before. Yes, we but have. He's gonna, what's that? I said, yes, yes, we have. So, so it's just he's going to bring up the first one, the first of these two key statements dealing with where Uriah Smith says uh, uh, that it's going to be a king, right? The only difficulty in applying it to a new power lies in the definite article, the, for it is urged, the expression the king would identify this as one last spoken of. If it could be properly translated a king, there would be no difficulty, right? And then he refers to some commentators who translate it that way, he says, thus clearly introducing a new power, and they must be correct, right? Um, 
so that's the first one. And then the second one, of course, was where we, we discussed this before, where, um, and there are seven kings, he changes to these are seven kings. But again, that just becomes a non sequitur in his argument, because he's going to actually hold that position. So I don't, I don't, we, we had problems with this before, just trying to understand why he saw this as such a key issue. Right? Here again, he looks to be supportive of Smith. He's trying to walk, he's trying to walk a line that is not logical. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, maybe this makes sense to him. It's not making sense because it, it's not making sense with me because as we have gone over the original portions of Smith's book, the fact that these statements were altered in the 1944 edition and the, the point that he is not addressing those altered statements comes to us as just an additional bit of information that lies unexamined. Yeah. Now, I know our time is almost up here for today. Right. But um, so, uh, you know, so we, we had gone through this. He's going to bring in a bunch of, well, he's just going to pile a bunch of stuff on at the end of this article. Right. Right. Um, and so I'm not really sure why he does that, like why he brings up all these other topics. Um, and especially when he comes to his conclusion, uh, when he's, He's going to try to say, well, I'm not in any way taking tearing down this book, right? But I'm not going to agree with a bunch of stuff in it. He's definitely not going to be convincing the people who he hasn't made an argument to change anybody's view who believes that Ellen White's endorsement of Uriah Smith means that he's correct right. regarding Turkey, right? He hasn't done any argument to show show this, like not not a single argument really um he stated some things of what he believes but he hasn't shown them he hasn't he hasn't actually demonstrated a use of miller's rules at all to show anything so so i mean all of this would just not be there to help anybody who's who's in this dilemma that he was in they're going to come to a completely different conclusion they're going to say well i have no problem i'm just going to accept what ellen white says and i'm going to Follow Uriah Smith. We saw that with right. Dave H. Steele, right? So he's just gonna go with Uriah Smith because Ellen White endorses it. And and again, he's never really gonna address the biblical arguments either, right? You know. So and and this is a problem. So I know we our time's up, but so one of the things we saw that the tendency that Adventists have, we can see that that is here. If it's going to be about the daily. How do they make their arguments? They take Ellen White's statements out of their context and they argue about Ellen White's statements, right? Right. You know, the daily is not a test question, what all those types of things, right? Or if it's the 2520, do they do a study on Leviticus 26 and try to understand how it's fulfilled? You know, do they, they try to see how these prophecies fit together? No, they just look at what Ellen White says or doesn't say, right? They're going to take, you know, Great Controversy uh, 351, and they're going to say, oh, you know, the last and longest prophecy, that's the 2300 days. She doesn't mention the seven times anywhere, or the 2520 anywhere in her writings, right? You know, those are the types of arguments they do. And 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 same here with, with this issue of Daniel 11, verse 36. They're going to argue about Ellen White's statements. But does anybody take the time to study the Bible, to apply Miller's rules, and to look for light from God's word? No. Right? Right. That's the tendency of Adventism. That is, as a, a friend of mine, uh, Ken Manning, who's passed away a long time ago, but he would say, when we study in that way, we're just lazy. Right? 
the people who just kind of read the spirit of prophecy in these superficial ways to find these statements to argue about different issues, that that's laziness. Like even the issue of Revelation 9, to understand Turkey, most people just argue, well, Ellen White endorses it. That's good enough for me. Is that good enough for us? Ellen White's endorsement of, of Josiah Litch's interpretation of Revelation 9. Is that good enough? No. No, because when, when we take that, one is, do we even understand his that prophecy? I would no. say that many people don't, right? Now, we've so we spent the time to study the prophecy in detail, to find all of this detail, to confirm that it is correct. And, and if we study the spirit of prophecy in that way, if we study the Bible in that way, well, Ellen White said this, are we built on a really strong foundation, right? If, if we just we just accept, well, Ellen White says, you know, 31 AD, 457, and somebody comes along and has all of these arguments against what Ellen White says, what is going to happen to our faith? We're just going to, abandoned spirit of prophecy correct that's what happens we've seen it thousands of times haven't we yes we have yeah and so that's why we're studying in this way because we want to be built on a solid foundation on the word of god not arguing these in this way about different statements in the spirit of prophecy without understanding the topic at all and, 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 you know, and I make an argument that, um, that this, this is the same as, uh, conspiracy theories. The reason why I believe that people who, who believe conspiracy theories aren't going to be saying that's a statement I've made, which is rather an extreme statement is just because of the way in which people study. They're not really studying. They're just accepting things that fit in with what they already believe. Some of the conspiracies could be true. But that's not really the issue. The issue is, how are you coming to understand what is true? How do you know when something's true and when some, something's false? And, and the type of arguments that people make are really bad arguments. They're, they're, they're party spirit arguments. And, and I've used this example before. So this is, I know we've gone a bit over time, but you know, I had this guitar student back when George Bush was, uh, you know, George Bush, the second George W. Bush was uh, president of the United States. And and uh, she believed that, you know, George Bush Bush blew up the World Trade Center. And I said, well, I don't believe that. She says, so you 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 support George Bush. Right. Now, you can see that's really a non sequitur. Right. Whether the World Trade Center was blown up by the United States or whether it was Islam has nothing to do with what I think about George Bush. But that's how people study. It's like, if you believe this, that means you're on this side of this issue. So we believe certain things because those things, this party, this group believes those things. And if you believe these other things, that means you must believe all of these other things, right? That we just group information into these into these clumps of information or ideas that have to do with who you believe, which group are you following? And we've seen that within this movement in how people decide, you know, what is truth. It's like, who's advocating it? You know, what are my friends doing? Uh, if I accept this idea, how am I going to be treated? Am I going to be bullied like, you know, other people are bullied? If I stand up, if I say anything, this is not how we come to understand truth. Okay, sorry about that. But, uh, don't be sorry. Yeah, well, I usually don't like to go over time. Okay, so we have come to the conclusion of our time today. Do we have any other comments or questions regarding what we've covered? Shall we then close this session in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are doing. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing and for the opportunities we have to understand clearly more about your character and these things that are presented. Help us through this day. Direct us in the steps that you would have us to follow. May your will be done. For this, Father, we ask and this, Father, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.